nations of the United States and Indonesia. Um, as I've mentioned before, uh, the president-elect of the United States begins his chapter on foreign policy in the book Audacity of Hope with the discussion of Indonesia, which he refers to as a metaphor for American foreign policy. I won't comment at length about that, but in any case, it's an interesting uh, discussion which he has. The president-elect, of course, uh, his degree is in international politics from Columbia. I should mention in passing, too, that one of our members, Dr. Faust, held the same fellowship at Columbia as Mr. Obama had held. Mr. Faust, you know from many questions which he's asked here. <laughs> the uh, Indonesia, of course, is the fifth largest nation in the world. It has a geographic size roughly the same as the outlines of the United States, except there's more water there than there is in the United States. But still, the, 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 the geographic scope is, is, is similar. Uh, I was one of those, uh, I had a lot of fun when I was a young man, uh, headquarters 13th Air Force as an intelligence officer. And uh, the first assignment my boss gave me was to study Indonesia. And uh, uh, the Outer Island Rebellion there took place and the cultivation of uh, the Indonesian Army by the United States Army was a major part of our foreign policy. Uh, Mr. Uh, Obama begins his discussion with when he arrived at age six in Indonesia in 1967. Um, the uh, Indonesia is not only important, uh, uh, is important because of its size, its great natural wealth. It's a major player within Southeast Asia. It's been a leader within the non-aligned movement uh, uh, for over half a century and continues to play a leadership role among uh, the countries of what was years ago called the Third World. Uh, the, uh, our guest this evening uh, the ambassador uh, uh, entered his foreign service in 1981. He was educated in uh, a university in Jakarta. He too has studied at Columbia University. Uh, he's had a variety of early positions within uh, the Indonesian Foreign Service. Uh, he's posted in Vienna, in Geneva twice, uh, studied questions of disarmament which he continued, and he continued to study national, or work on national security and uh, questions of nonproliferation. He was involved in the middle of his career uh, with questions of each East Timor, to which he paid close attention for a number of professional years. He's been posted in the Indonesian permanent uh, 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 embassy in, in, uh, in the United Nations, he was minister counselor there. He uh, also has served as uh, the head of the Department of International Organizations in the Foreign, in the, uh, foreign Affairs Department of, of the uh, Foreign Service. Uh, and uh, most recently, before becoming ambassador to the United States in uh, January of 2006, he served as the uh, General Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, I should also note that he's headed numerous delegations on behalf of Indonesia uh, uh, to the uh, Asia-Africa Forum, to uh, ASEAN uh, groups, and uh, uh, to the uh, study of various forms of, of uh, questions of, of arms control and proliferation. Uh, we're interested in Indonesia. It's a nice coincidence that our president-elect uh, has chosen to take it very seriously. It's my great pleasure to present to you uh, the ambassador of Indonesia, uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Sujadnan Parmno Hadinengrad. May I begin by expressing my thanks to Mr. Frank Bird, President of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs, for inviting me to speak 
on this August forum. I didn't expect that um, the number of the audience as big as this, and I really have to express my uh, great pleasure to have been able to be in front of such an audience to share with you the uh, state of affairs in terms of uh, the relations between Indonesia and United States within uh, these last few years, especially during my service in Washington, D.C., which began in January 2006. I would like to divide my presentations into three parts. In the first part, I'd like to update you all with some of the important development taking place in Indonesia. In the second part, I will address the state of Indonesia and U.S. bilateral relations. In the last part of my presentations, I'd like to share with you some thought and perspective regarding the United States role in Southeast Asia. Now, um, let me dwell upon the development in Indonesia. As you uh, may know, um, my country, our country, um, located in Southeast Asia as the largest archipelagic state in the world. Indonesia consists of more than 17,000 islands with populations of some 235 million today, which I think make us to become the fourth largest nations in the world and making it the most populous nations in Southeast Asia, after China, of course, India, and the United States. Similar to the United States of America, Indonesia is also a melting pot of rich cultural diversity, a product of century upon century of cultural and religious assimilation. Today, more than 80% of the populations of Indonesia is Muslim, while the rest adhere to Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, and other forms of indigenous beliefs. These past 10 years have emerged as one of the most important periods in the history of Indonesia. We have revived and rebuilt our economy out of the most devastating financial crisis in generations. We have recovered from one of the most damaging natural disasters in the world I've ever seen, and we have not merely survived many terror attacks that aim to destabilize, intimidate, and create fears amongst our society, but we have also been very successful in crushing this terrorist network and in dealing with the violence and extremist ideologies that spawned these terrorists in the first place. From 2002, October, when uh, a group of terrorists attacked Bali, uh, we have been able to round up, to arrest, and to bring to trial some 345 perpetrators. And even three of them within these last few uh, weeks, uh, you may know, has been executed since the uh, death penalty is still being enforced in Indonesia. All these progress have created a stable political system in our country within the new democratic environment. Today, Indonesia can take pride in being a new and vibrant democracy. As a diverse and pluralistic society, Indonesians cherish the value of freedoms and tolerance based on the principle of unity and diversity. The Indonesian government is fully committed to uphold and implement those principles in the conduct of the statehood. Much, however, remains to be done. The country needs to have higher economic growth in order to reduce unemployment, alleviate poverty, and improve the welfare of the society. Economic development is crucial, not only to provide basic needs for the people, but also to further consolidate the democratic transitions that are now taking place in Indonesia. Improved security and stable political environment have allowed us to set our economy into path of dynamic and sustainable growth. In the past three years, the income per capita has increased by 64% from around 1,200 in 2004 and just below 2000s in 2007. With, of course, um, the understanding that within this year to come, we may face the same challenge of financial crisis, which have been 
filed in Indonesia, and uh, we are trying to do whatever possible to um, address the uh, issue of this financial crisis. In time where many parts of the world are suffering from food crisis, this year Indonesia is able to achieve self-sufficiency in rice productions, ensuring food safety for more than 230 million people. In 2007, the Indonesian economy grew by 6.3%. And even though on the last quarter of 2008, as I have just dwelt upon, we are facing a global financial crisis, nevertheless, we are optimistic that we can achieve growth rate of around 5.5 to 6% in 2008. For 2009, we are anticipating a much more difficult economic conditions due to the recessions and most of the major economies in Europe, America, and Asia. Let me now dwell upon the uh, state of affairs in Indonesia and the U.S. bilateral relations. Today, Indonesia is proud to call itself as the third largest democracy in the world after India and United States. As a country with largest Muslim populations, Indonesia are also proud to showcase that Islam and democracy are compatible one another. Together, they serve a strong foundations for the progress and advancement of the Indonesian society. As democratic and pluralistic societies, Indonesia and the United States share many common interests, and therefore it is our mutual benefit to further strengthen and elevate the bilateral relations between the two countries. Indeed, there are many factors that serve as the platform for building closer strategic bilateral relations between Indonesia and the U.S. I have observed and tried to encapsulate in at least in five um, factors. That is that first is the shared value of democracy as the basis for cooperation in various fields. Um, in 2004, the first time, we astonished ourselves when we noticed that there were around 121 million people came to a polling stations that spread over the country with some 574,000 uh, polling booths for them to elect their leaders. The fact that um, the um, landscape of Indonesia, the geographical contour, and the uh, backwardness that's still being with us. People in some uh, part of Indonesia had to walk, have to walk to the polling stations for two days and two nights to cast the force. And yet we were able to get some, as I said, 120 million people to vote, and it's amazing. So we are proud of what we have achieved, and we are trying to consolidate this um, part of democracy since 2004 until today. And next year, 2009, we are going to um, hold uh, the second uh, direct elections. If in the United States you elect your electorate, we are not electing our electorate in the 2009 and even 2004, but we are going to elect our president and vice president directly members of parliaments uh, directly, and as I said, even people have to work two nights and two days to elect. And this is what we uh, thought become the uh, fundamental for the uh, relations between the two countries, the platform of democracy. We learn a lot from what you've done here. You've been uh, with this value of democracy for hundreds of years, and we have just started, and we learn a lot about that. And second, uh, in the relations between us, is the shared interest to expand our economic and trade ties in many sectors, including energy for mutual benefit. Uh, the total volume of the trade between Indonesia and United States today reached the level of around 18.5 billion US dollar. And you may know that um, all those big oil companies are operating in Indonesia. Exxon, Mobil, Saffron, and um, their friends um, are now working very hard to find new reserve, and uh, we are happy to um, be able to uh, open our uh, society for their involvement in the process of deciding who are going to get the contract. So um, this is one of the factors, the second factor. And the third is the continuing common endeavor to fight against global terrorism. 
I mentioned um, since 2002, uh, Bali bombing, we were able to round up some 340 uh, people, 40 perpetrators, 300, 340 perpetrators, and brought them to trial and all those. But uh, more than what we have done in terms of um, operations of our police and uh, enforcement of our law, what we are proud about is that uh, the uh, 200 million Muslim in Indonesia are those that are willing to be with the government to mitigate the influence of radicalism and extremism. And what uh, have made our government uh, proud about was that the fact that um, the influence of this extremism and radicalism can be overwhelmed by the number of uh, Indonesians Muslim moderate. In Indonesia, there are at least two big Muslim organizations. The first one called Muhammadiyah. This organization has claimed to have around 35 million follower members. And uh, the second, no, even the, the, the first one, the, the, this is the second. And the first biggest one, the biggest one is Nadatul Ulama, which has claimed, which claims to have around 45 million followers. So if you put this 35 and 45, it come up to 80 million. These are a structured Islamic organizations that have um, been in the life of our country since 1945, when we first declared our independence. Um, try to serve as the catalyst for the uh, Islamic follower, for the Muslim follower in Indonesia to uh, what the modernism, modernism to, toward the uh, pluralistic society. Indonesia is a country which um, has a constitution that fully guarantee the uh, independence, the freedom of everyone, uh, every nationals to adhere any religions. And with this 80 million uh, follower of these two organizations, plus another hundred of millions of those who adhere the religions, um, and uh, the context of implement their traditions, uh, their, uh, their, their uh, value of being, of living in harmony with uh, you know, one another. Indonesia, uh, very uh, optimistic, we are optimistic, we are, we are confident that we can um, fight the uh, extremism and uh, those that being spread by very few uh, people from elsewhere. So with this, um, we are uh, very sure that the um, fighting against terrorism will be uh, successful at the end. And the fourth uh, factor is the common interest to preserve and maintain international peace and stability, particularly in Southeast Asia regions. We call it as the building of the architecture of Asia. We call it as the process of how we, um, among countries in Asian regions, uh, will be living in harmony to face the common challenge that we are facing today. If you have a look at China, for instance, um, a country with one point, almost 1.4 billion uh, populations with an economic growth of around 9 to 10 percent. If you uh, have a look at uh, India, for instance, a country with 1.2 1.25 billion populations with the economic growth of around 8.5 percent. And if you um, look at the need of energy, if you look at what they need to uh, continue to grow, then um, there is always a potential for um, countries like that, like what I have just mentioned, to uh, be in uh, hostile situations because of uh, how to find uh, the need of energy that um, grows from, for instance, in China, I don't know, probably around 4.5 million barrel per day, in the uh, increase of around 20 percent uh, per year. So if you calculate that, then every year they need um, energy of um, something like 4.5 up to 5, and then 6 million barrel per day. In India, for instance, they need around 3.5 million barrel per day. Until today, maybe they um, try to uh, conserve their energy and try to uh, not to depend their economic growth from, from this oil. But uh, in fact, this is uh, the situation that they are facing. And uh, if you have a look at the southern part of uh, 
southeastern part of Asia, then uh, you may find that there is a country that named Indonesia with 230 million people. They also need energy. So um, the, uh, I call the architecture of uh, Asia as being built by a country that also that needs uh, the uh, growth uh, for their people to live, and energy is one of uh, the factor. And if you look at level of consumption here in, in the United States, you need around 19 to 20 million barrel per day. So everybody of us um, are in need of energy. So it may become a catalyst at one point, and it, it, at the same time, it can become a source of tension. So um, in uh, the, the, the quest for a stable and secure relations of a country in the regions, I think it is only natural that country like Indonesia um, think the uh, importance of being uh, together, of working together to um, establish a secure and, uh, and a safe information uh, and, and um, relations that uh, will assure the, uh, the need of, of, of energy for the, the ease of the country to, to live. So um, United States has also been an indispensable partner in our economic development efforts. The US is the third largest market for Indonesia's non-oil and gas export, as I have just mentioned earlier. Uh, the U.S. and Asia. This country had had a long, strong presence in Asia, including Southeast Asia, and the U.S. long-term relationship with the major powers in Asia, particularly China, Japan, and India, is critical to the stability of the whole regions. Ever since the end of World War II, the United States has been a pillar of stability in Asia Pacific. With the growing prosperity and affluence, new powerhouses have emerged among the countries in Asia. Japan, as I mentioned, um, has been and will continue to be the second largest economy in the world for the foreseeable future. And China, as I just said, is already on its way to become major global economic and military power. And India has also emerged as a growing economic powerhouse. The dynamism of their relations in the regions and beyond should be diligently managed. The United States and countries in the regions need to creatively seek new areas of cooperation and enhance the existing ones and conduct dialogues aimed at building and strengthening mutual trust among the countries concerned. This is what I call as building the architecture of Asia. With regard to Southeast Asia last year, the associations of Southeast Asian nations, or ASEAN, and U.S. has celebrated the 13th anniversary of the ASEAN-U.S. dialogue relations. This country is the most important market for Southeast Asian countries in terms of direct trade, with a total trade of around 170 billion in 2007. The U.S. is the second largest trading partner of ASEAN. It consists of 10 countries of Southeast Asia. Well, ASEAN is now the for United States larging, uh, largest trading partner. In terms of foreign direct investment, many U.S. companies are operating in gas, oil, and mining industry, which are relative abundance through the regions. Countries in Southeast Asia are today facing various non-traditional security challenges, such as piracy, drugs, and people smuggling, and other trans-border issues. One of the most pressing challenges that some countries in the region have to face is what I see it as the threat of radicalism, extremism, that seek to destroy the political and socioeconomic foundations upon which progress and prosperity have been built. Dealing with these challenges requires enhanced national capability and cooperation at regional and international level. Building national and regional capabilities is priority for countries in the regions, and the United States continue to have important role to assist countries in the regions to develop such capabilities. Our police work very closely with your FBI in um, rounding up all this terrorist ring in Indonesia, and uh, we are very proud to be part of the global effort together with this country. And um, Indonesia has benefited greatly from such cooperations. 
At the same time, the soft power approach that has been conducted by our government, as I said earlier, to address the challenges of radicalism and extremism can become a valuable lesson learned for uh, countries uh, that are partnering with Indonesia. As their political security and economic interests become increasingly integrated and interdependent, so this Asia has been developing a regional architecture that rests on the operations of the ASEAN, as I just dwelled upon earlier. So with the um, role of the United States has been pres which has been present in the region for years, then we would like to see the relations between the regions and this country strengthen in the future and for the benefit of uh, people in the regions and the United States in general. I thank you very much for all your kind attention. Well, thank you very much for your informative uh, and interesting uh, overview. The ambassador will now accept questions. The uh, Mr. Bernstein asks uh, or observes that uh, you're no longer a member of OPEC. Uh, does that create oil problems for you? <laughs> thank you very much. I uh, just before this uh, program start, just talk with one of the guests in here that Indonesia um, in the past until 1996, produced around 1.6 million barrel per day of oil. And uh, since um, investment in this uh, area uh, declined, we also have uh, the, we also experienced the declining uh, oil productions down to around 1 million barrel per day. And even today, we only produce 970,000 uh, 970, barrel per day. And the oil consumptions in, in, in the country uh, keep on uh, growing. Uh, as of that uh, point in time. And today we consume around 1.25 million barrel per day. So therefore we uh, sort of um, some 300,000 barrel per day that we have to import from elsewhere. So um, we feel that it is, it is, we find it difficult for us to continue to become OPEC member being a net importer of oil. So while we are trying to uh, recover uh, new reserve, while we are inviting as many as possible uh, oil companies to um, increase their investment in Indonesia, we uh, consider it important for us not to um, involve in the OPEC activities and at the same time concentrating on consolidating our effort together with these oil companies to, uh, recover, to, to, to find new reserve. So, um, if you ask about um, how we will deal with this issue, that is that we invite as many as possible uh, companies to come and um, put their investment in the oil productions. Um, the negotiations underway with a number of uh, big oil companies for us to find a new reserve. It is not that we have um, the reserve depleted, but only that investment that is made within this last 10 years declined. And now we uh, need to, to, to uh, again, in, uh, increase the, the, the level of investment. Is um, income disparity a problem in Indonesia? Indeed, <laughs> it is. So there are a um, group of um, very wealthy people with an income per capita for um, year 2007, 2008 that reached the level of 25 to 35,000 uh, US dollars per year. But there are those that um, reach the only level of income per capita, probably less than 1,000 US dollar per year. So uh, when I uh, offered you the figure in my uh, presentations, I uh, cited uh, the uh, level of around 2,000 that is, uh, consists of those that um, can uh, reach um, the level of wealth with some 25 to 35,000, and then those that only uh, less than 1,000. So uh, one of the uh, way on how we address this issue was that um, since um, around 2000s, we um, adopted the new bill on um, autonomy. We devolute the um, power um, distributions from uh, centralistic uh, kind of government in the past to become more um, autonomous uh, regions uh, in, throughout Indonesia. We have 33 provinces in Indonesia and the um, devolution of uh, the uh, power is being uh, vigorously done by the central government and uh, we are trying as best to um, 
conduct a cross-subsidy policy uh, amongst the, the uh, provinces that have uh, the higher level income per capita to those that are unfortunate uh, in, in unfortunate situations. This is one of the way on how we address the issue. And secondly, we are vigorously trying to um, uh, post up the uh, economic sources uh, from industry, uh, agriculture, agriculture industry, and um, manufacturing to uh, uh, provinces that are unfortunate uh, to have uh, less uh, capacity in uh, their uh, peoples uh, in, 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 in trying to, to um, share their welfare. So uh, first is uh, devolutions of, of, of authority, and second is uh, cross-subsidy amongst the provinces, and uh, thirdly is that we are vigorously trying to implement different kind of alleviations of poverty policies, and um, that um, we, uh, in this regard, being helped by a uh, number of uh, developed countries uh, to address a very particular issue of uh, poverty alleviations. So these uh, three, um, at least these three measures that we are uh, doing uh, nowadays. The uh, question is, what is the situation? And I say the uh, northern Sumatra, an area in which they had a tsunami problem, an earthquake. What's the political situation there now? Thank you, sir. Um, the conflict between uh, the rebels group from uh, that particular part of Indonesia, uh, northern part of Sumatra, that called Aceh, with Indonesian government has been going on since 1976 until 2005. Soon after the tsunami has stricken in 2004, December, um, people in the regions and Indonesian government thought that um, there is only one way to um, help the suffering, that is that to reach peace, peace, peace between rebels and the Indonesian government. And it is not only on the Indonesian government's part that uh, consider it important to reach the peace, but also on the rebel, on the, on the part of the rebel. So in 2005, uh, August, Indonesian government and this rebel group, what we call as Gerakan Aceh Merdeka or Free Aceh Movement, um, has reached an agreement in Helsinki and, and Finland uh, with the assistance of uh, former President Atisari, we um, have signed the uh, peace agreement with the rebel and implemented with the supervisions with the, uh, and, uh, super, and implemented and overseen by some 250 uh, observer come from various countries in Europe. And with the um, implementations of uh, the agreement since 2005, 2006, we, into, at the end of 2006, we um, held a local elections to elect the government uh, leaders of this part of uh, Indonesia. And um, it happened that the governor, governor of Aceh today is those, is those that um, in the past on the part of uh, the, the rebel. But uh, yet the peace is being um, implemented and peace is achieved um, very strongly in Aceh. And it uh, becomes source of source of pride for Indonesia to um, have been able to solve this conflict uh, until today. And peace is there. Uh, how much how much help do you get with the education of your children uh, from outside countries? What percentage is it? And can you identify the countries that help? Thank you. Um, the fact that we are no uh, in, in terms of the government uh, policy is being very uh, strongly uh, controlled by our parliament. We have adopted a uh, law in 2004 uh, that stipulated Indonesian government to allocate some 20% of our uh, uh, national budget for education. So it is a kind of obligatory uh, rule that we have to provide this fund. So um, if we talk about uh, the foreign participations in the um, uh, education budget. Um, I can only uh, remember that at least the national budget for Indonesia uh, in 2008 was something like um, 89 to 90 billion US dollar. And then 20% of that have to be allocated for uh, education. So 20% of around 
90 billion is something like uh, 15, 16 billion US dollar. And uh, we received in 2003, I vividly remember, the contributions by this country of 150 million US dollar for our education, um, not only for the children, but also for <laughs> higher education. So in fact, the uh, fund that is um, included in the 20% uh, of our budget is not, is not very high. Of course, we receive um, different kind of, of, of assistance and grant, but if, if you compare with this 20% of, of the budget that have to be allocated from our national budget, then uh, not, not, not very significant. A scholarship um, has become very rare now, uh, granted by a country like United States unlike in the past, but uh, we continue to receive a scholarship uh, from um, USAID through the um, operations of Fulbright, Fulbright uh, uh, foundations, for instance, but uh, continue to decline and uh, we really need to, to, to increase this. A uh, country like uh, Australia also participate in our education system, especially um, for the eastern part of Indonesia. And um, our um, former colony, uh, colonials, uh, Dutch, the Netherlands, also have a very uh, good part in the education uh, development in Indonesia. But to put it short, um, it's big, but not as significant as we expect. Would you comment upon your relations with the Middle East in general, Saudi Arabia and Iran in particular? Thank you very much. I can put into the uh, in, into at least two uh, level of, of relations. There is first within the context of membership of our country to the OIC, Organizations of Islamic Conference, and bilateral relations with each of the country in the Middle East. Within the uh, Organizations of Islamic Conference, we have um, around 56 membership, and in Indonesia, one of them. So we. Uh, we work very closely with the country from uh, the Middle East Eastern region to deal with or to, to address different kind of issues uh, of common concern in the OIC. So we have a very good relations with them in this context of implementing the organization's uh, programs and uh, activities uh, in, 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 in addressing different kind of issues. No, uh, bilaterally, uh, we have very uh, cordial and good relations, of course, with Iran, with Saudi Arabia. But um, say, for instance, with Iran, we are very close, but become a close friend, we are very blunt in saying if they do something uh, beyond uh, the interests of the international community, of course, we are being very close friend. We uh, remind them that please don't do what, what, what you've done. I'm, take, I'm talking about the uh, uh, Iran issues uh, uh, of, of uh, potential proliferations of uh, nuclear weapons in, in the area. Um, President Ahmadinejad came to Indonesia at once, and President uh, of Indonesia also have uh, met with uh, this uh, leadership uh, several times. But every time we talk about the principles of non-proliferations, that is governed by the non-proliferation treaty of nuclear weapons. Indonesia is state party of the non-proliferation treaty, and being a state party, we would like every single state party to adhere fully the principles and objective of the treaty. So we are very close, but um, we are far apart if any one of the state party of the NPT trying to breach the, uh, the, the provisions of the treaty. So, well, I would like to put it in this context. So we are very close and cordial, but uh, we, we try to, to, to uh, uh, to remind everybody to be uh, uh, in the uh, full implementations of, of our commitment in this uh, in this very uh, uh, in the, the provisions provisions and article of the treaty. So, well, I, I really want to to illustrate this. Would you uh, describe piracy in your area, and uh, what nations are dealing with it? Thank you very much. Um, the Malacca Strait, um, a strait that separates the uh, island of Sumatra and uh, Malaysia Peninsula, um, is a strait with length of around 95 to 100 uh, kilometers, which is around 60 miles. And this is a strait that is being used, that is used 
for uh, the uh, navigations of around 60 to 70,000 vessels every year. Um, in uh, the years of 2004, 2005, and, and before, the level of uh, occurrence of, uh, of incidents of piracy um, was gone to a level of around uh, reach, uh, more than 150 uh, incidents. And in 2007, there were only 16 incidents. I remember this, this number for um, being uh, part of the, uh, uh, but Indonesia being part of the International Maritime Organization and the, the, the number come from, from that organization. Um, the country that involved in the um, uh, fighting against the piracy in the Malacca Strait, uh, the literal state, literal state of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. You know, the United Nations Conventions on the Law of the Sea divide different kind of uh, category of membership. And those that fall under the category of literal state, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. And those three countries, um, by law, by the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, is obliged to um, uh, establish a secure, secure environment in the region. So three literal states, and it is being helped by United States of America and um, most of the country in Europe in the context of uh, corporations under the IMO scheme. So uh, countries in Europe, United States, and the three countries, three literal states in, 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 the, in the region. Would you comment upon the state of tourism in Indonesia? Thank you very much. Um, prior to Bali bombing in 2002, uh, we were able to um, have around 7 million, uh, 6.5 to 7 million tourists per year. Uh, this is the level of 2001 and 2002. And after the uh, incidents, the bombing, um, the number went down to less than uh, 3 million. And uh, we suffered from uh, the uh, declining of the presence of uh, the tourists to Indonesia. And the, this is 2002. The level of uh, uh, arrival went up to around uh, 4 to 4.5 million in 2004. And yet we had the second Bali bombing in 2000. Bali bo second Bali bombing was 2005, was it? And uh, went down again to less than 3 million. And now we are able to uh, gather or to, 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 to be a place for some f 6 million tourists come to Indonesia in the 2007 and 2008. And we expect that in 2009 we have uh, more uh, people to come, more tourists to come. And I would like to um, also uh, share with you the, in the past, uh, in tourists that come to, from in, uh, to Indonesia are from, uh, those are from uh, Europe and uh, United States and Australia, with less tourists come from uh, Japan and China. And nowadays the uh, pattern or the composition um, different, uh, change. There's that we have more tourists from China and Japan and even um, quite a number of uh, tourists come from Russian Federation, from Russia. So we uh, invite you all to uh, add into <laughs> number of American tourists to come. <laughs> the question is, uh, uh, how much money do you spend on the military? Uh, what kind of weapons do you have? And what is their source? Thank you. We, have, we are the true believer of soft power. So we allocate very small budget for our military. I uh, mentioned in one of my present in, in, in at one point of my presentations that the Indonesian uh, national budget for 2008 um, is something like 90 billion US dollar, a very small one. And out of this 90 billion US dollar, um, only around 4.2 no, billion for our military. 4.2 billion, if you compare with this country, 565, then 4.2 is just nuts, a very small one. So if you ask about the percentage, it is around 4.2 billion US dollar as against uh, 90 billion, so uh, less than, mm, probably less than 0.5%.
And if you ask about the source of our uh, military equipments and weapons, um, we still have uh, our weapon system um, in the uh, in the Western in the Western system of weaponry. That is that um, uh, the uh, what's uh, I force I force airplane configurations when we fly. This is it. it they, they fly under the or within the context of of um, American or European uh, squadron, the, the compositions. And um, the weapons that we uh, procure, um, in fact, uh, it's a very old one. The, the, the uh, aeroplane, for instance, we only have very few F-16. That is the, the, the newest one. And we recently just bought uh, Half squadron, six six species of Sukhoi from uh, uh, Russian Federations, and um, we are in a uh, difficult situation nowadays. That is that um, we've been given a freedom, we've been given access to uh, American uh, weapon system uh, after the embargo was lifted in 2005, but we do not have the capacity, we do not have the fund to buy. So yes, we, we, most of our weapon system come from Western world, from Europe and United States. Uh, but when you ask about the allocations of budget, we said uh, around four billion, which is very small. And uh, we are very uh, limited in terms of our capacity to procure new weapons. So therefore I said we are the true believer of soft power. The, the year of living dangerously, how accurately was Indonesia represented? Thank you, as I uh, remember, if, if I remember correct, correctly, this film was produced or was, was made in, in one of the southern part of the, the Philippines. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, that's because of uh, that uh, film producer in Indonesia that on that years um, prior, to, prior to 1998, during the authoritarian regime uh, were not uh, as free as today in uh, expressing their uh, their their um, what's it their their thinking of how to uh, to 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 uh, show Indonesia is like. So therefore, they 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 made the film in the southern part of the Philippines. Uh, in fact, um, if it was uh, meant to reflect the situations in 1960s. I think it's somewhat is, 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 is true. We were in a very uh, distressed situation uh, around the years of 60, 65 until probably 67. And um, nowadays, uh, if, if, if you refer to that film and to be uh, put in the context of what we are um, experiencing today, that's completely different, completely different world in terms of freedom, in terms of uh, the oppressions by the government to uh, the people. Um, we are proud of being the most uh, free country in terms of our press. And I have been here for three years, and I noticed that our press is more free in expressing anything to compare with what you've done in here. We learn from you, but... <laughs> I don't know, I have Indonesian colleagues uh, who are sitting in front of me. If, if you uh, talk about fresh freedom in Indonesia, it's just, just amazing that uh, you may criticize, they criticize everything. Every single part of the government policy, every single uh, uh, policy, uh, uh, what is it, uh, statement made by president or government officer being criticized. No, no, no days without uh, you know, critical views of our, our press. So. The context of that film in today is, is completely different. But if you talk about the film at that moment in time, and in the year 60, 65, until 1970s, I think it's, uh, well, it's, it's true, like, like what they saw in the film. Thank you. Within the Islamic Conference, how, how do you, if you do, counsel other states as to how to conduct a successful economy within the context of the Islamic faith? Thank you. Um, in uh, Islam, we um, have the concept of Ummah, the uh, brotherhood uh, among, uh, you know, uh, among, among Islamic followers. And uh, the organizations of Islamic uh, conference uh, somewhat um, implement this kind of Ummah. 
that is that uh, those uh, country that um, uh, are well off compared to those that are unfortunate uh, have to uh, contribute into the development of uh, the least the least the least fortunate um, however uh, the um, conduct of um, economic cooperation among member of the uh, Organization of Islamic Conference is done in such a way that uh, we cannot um, separate the Islamic group uh, from the present practice of um, the uh, world economy. So um, one thing is that um, we uh, are trying to implement this uh, UMA. At the same time, we implementing this into uh, in, within the context of the global economy of today. So um, you may interpret that there is intention, there is of course will to implement uh, the uh, brotherhood in Islam in the context of sharing the wealth, but at the same time we are living in the reality that uh, this is the world market. So market principles and UMA principles is, is, being, uh, is being tried, uh, is, I mean the organization of Islamic conference um, uh, develop uh, economic cooperation in this context of the, the two principles. What is the degree of freedom Thank for you. women in Indonesia? Well, uh, really, we have to be very proud of what the women have achieved in Indonesia. We have one woman president, President Megawati, uh, two, three years, no, uh, that stepped down in 2004. And I would like to give you an illustration, just, just how women in Indonesia, uh, especially in uh, at the urban level, have achieved the level of um, equality with men. Uh, I come from the Department of Foreign Affairs the State Department of Indonesia. The State Department uh, of Indonesia, the Department of Foreign Affairs, recruited um, 96 diplomats in 2003. And then from 2003 until 2008, even, even until this year, we recruit around 95 to 100. 95 to 100 new diplomats who are uh, fresh graduate from different universities. And in 2003, there were 12,000, 12,400 applicants. Out of these 12,000, 12,400 applicants, we recruited 96 uh, with a very um, tight competitions with uh, six steps of six, uh, six what's that? Six um, level of of tests. And from uh, what we had, what we got in 1996. In, in, in 2003, 96 uh, rec new, newly recruited. There were 40, uh, Ricky? 40, f out of the 96, we got 51, 51, 51 men, and then 40, 44, 48 women, 45 women. So 51 men, and then 45 women. This is in 2003. And then in 2004, uh, the figure changed. Uh, we got around 96, and 50 men, 48 women. So almost half of them uh, women. This is at the uh, well-educated level. So in the countryside, in the um, in the in the, the grassroots level, of course, the participations of women still need in uh, you know uh, still need to be posted by different kind of policies. Then therefore we establish a department or ministry, ministry for the empowerment of women. So um, at the education, at the well-educated uh, group of uh, people, we have uh, particip participations of women in every um, activities of, of, of the country, uh, very high, but uh, down there we still in need to post up their, their, their involvement in, in every respect. Is your legal system based upon Sharia law? And then a related way of stating that, uh, what is the uh, relationship between uh, church and state uh, in Indonesia? Oh, first the answer is no, because our constitution is a national constitution, is a constitution that does not, um, that does not uh, adopt any, any religions, any religions uh, belief but this is a, a, a purely um, a constitution that was um, uh, invented out of the um, struggle against the colonialism. 
So uh, this is very, uh, very nationalistic uh, kind of, of constitutions that um, allow every nationals, every citizens to uh, adhere any religions without hindrance whatsoever. And um, relations between um, religions and the uh, state, um, we are some kind of secular, semi-secular uh, state. Why I'm saying semi-secular? Because um, we, uh, although base our, although Indonesia base its uh, existence um, uh, from the uh, constitution that I've just uh, touched upon, but um, the government provide the uh, religious uh, educations. So in Indonesia, we have a department of, 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 of religions that provide educations for the preliminary, um, secondary to, to, to uh, the high school level, a, a educations in religions. It's not only in Islam, but also in uh, other religions. So every uh, school in Indonesia has um, a teacher who teach religions um, that we uh, that is exist in Indonesia. Uh, most um, of them, of course, um, uh, attend uh, the Islamic uh, religions uh, educations. But those who are not uh, Muslim, uh, the government provide a teacher for uh, the pupils to uh, learn or to develop their knowledge in religion. So. Um, this is based on the uh, constitution that I have just said. And the uh, Sharia law um, is uh, introduced in the, um, uh, the province of Aceh, the northern part of Sumatra. But at the same time, uh, this law um, is uh, being uh, implemented subsumed under the national positive law of Indonesia. So um, the Sharia law is not the one that uh, become the reference for the enforcement of, uh, for in, in its enforcement, uh, the um, Sharia law is uh, being implemented within the context of implementations or enforcement of national law. I have to apologize to those of you that still have questions. It is 10 minutes after 7, and we do try to end promptly on time. Uh, this has been a most informative evening. We thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you.